Hey everyone. So far, up until now, everything we have rendered has been a solid and completely opaque object. This means that none of the incoming light is allowed to pass through. This corresponds to the alpha component for every fragment being equal to 1. Well, we do have one exception, and that's the billboard we use for the point light objects. In the case a fragment falls outside the light's radius, we discard it. This is mostly equivalent to having an alpha value of 0. But what about all of the other possible values in between 0 and 1? Conceptually, the alpha component says what percentage of the color to contribute to the final image. So, for example, if we wanted to add a blue tinted window to the scene that lets three quarters of the light behind it pass through, then it should be as simple as rendering a quad with its alpha component set to one quarter. The final fragment color should be 25% the color of the window, plus 1 minus 25% the color of whatever is behind the window. The graphics pipeline also already provides a fixed function step to do this for us. If you recall way back to tutorial 4, the final stage of the graphics pipeline is the color blending stage. This occurs automatically following the fragment shader and is even configurable. It can mix the previous and incoming color to produce a new mixed value, or it can combine the previous and incoming value using a bitwise operation. So far, this should all sound very straightforward, and you may be wondering why we just didn't enable color blending from the very start, and that's because there is one pretty significant gotcha when working with transparency. The order in which we render semi-transparent objects actually matters. The reason for this can be a bit counterintuitive, especially if you spent any time using art editing software where an image is broken up into a sequence of layers. When working with layers, partial transparency isn't an issue because we know the alpha component for each pixel at each layer, and there is a well-defined ordering of layers from front to back. But this is the wrong mental model to have for our pipeline-based rendering. Let's jump back to tutorial 4 for a quick review. Previously, I've compared depth values to being like the layers in an image editing program, but this analogy isn't exactly true. A depth buffer doesn't keep track of individual layers, but only the depth value to whatever fragment is currently on top for each pixel. For example, let's say so far we have rendered some mountains and our color buffer looks like this. Then the matching depth buffer would look something like this, where light shades are far away and darker shades correspond to a fragment being closer. Now if we wanted to draw a cloud, what would happen is that for each pixel of the cloud, we check its depth against the current values in the depth buffer. We only update the color and depth buffers for pixels where the cloud is the closest fragment. So in this case, if our cloud had a depth of around 0.8, then it is less than the sky's value, but greater than the mountains. Any of the cloud's fragments behind the mountains are simply discarded. So, how does this relate to semi-transparent objects? Well, the depth buffer can store only one depth value per pixel, and doesn't care about how transparent an object is. If the window is rendered before the vase object behind it, then the depth buffer will be storing the window's depth, which is closer to the camera. Therefore, the vase fragments will get discarded. A simple solution is to first render all the solid objects in the scene, followed by every semi-transparent object. However, even this solution isn't perfect and breaks down when multiple semi-transparent objects overlap. You can work around this by first sorting each semi-transparent object by its distance from the camera, and then rendering in the order from back to front. What about if the camera moves, or a model moves? Sorting every object by distances every frame can require a lot of computation. And even that will break down in certain scenarios. It's possible to overlap three triangles such that from the perspective of the camera, Properly ordering them becomes impossible, and we need to order per fragment. So unfortunately, there isn't an easy solution that handles every case. There do exist a class of techniques known as order-independent transparency that solves this complicated problem, but all of which have prerequisite topics we would need to cover first. So I guess that's it. Thank you for watching, and, well, not quite. I would still like to demonstrate blending, and if the only semi-transparent objects in the scene are the point lights, then this is a simple case we can make work. Point lights are billboards and always face the camera, therefore we avoid the case where triangles can overlap, and we do not need to sort individual vertices. 
The only thing that will affect the ordering is the position of the point light. Okay, so let's get to coding. First, we will need to render all the solid objects in the scene. So in the first app implementation files run function, make sure your simple render systems render game objects function is being called before the point light systems render function. Typically when rendering any semi-transparent objects, you will want to first render all the solid objects, then render your semi-transparent objects. Next, we're going to head over to the pipeline header to add a helper function to enable alpha blending. First though, if you haven't yet corrected this yourself, I have a mistake in the pipeline config info struct. We really should be setting the constructor function equal to the default. This is because whenever you edit any of the copy or remove constructors, you should also explicitly default or implement the constructor. Not doing so can cause errors when using other compilers. Now, just below the default pipeline config info, we will add a second static void function called enable alpha blending that will also take a pipeline config info reference called pipeline. This will be a helper function to easily enable alpha blending for a pipeline config. Then at the bottom of our pipeline implementation file, we can add the implementation for this. We already have an example setting the necessary fields for the color blend attachment in the default function above. So scroll up and copy that chunk of code and paste it into your enable function. To enable alpha blending, we need to change a few of the fields here. First, we set the blend enable field to VK true. You may be wondering why we don't have this field always set to true for all pipelines, and that's because there is a performance cost to having it enabled. We need to perform the blending operations. The color write mask can remain unchanged since we want to write the RGB and A components. The next six fields correspond to variables in this equation and determine how exactly RGB values and alpha values are combined. The source is the current value being output from the fragment shader. So in our case, we call it the out color. The destination is whatever values exist at that fragment in our color attachment. So before we've rendered anything, this will be equal to whatever we've set the clear value of our render pass. So in our case, when writing a color, we want to use its alpha component as the source blend factor and one minus the source alpha as how much the existing value in the color attachment contributes. As long as we render solid objects first and then semi-transparent objects from farthest to closest, this method will work fine. The color blend op should be VK blend op add since we want to add these values together. And the last three fields for alpha blending don't actually matter for our purposes here, since we don't check what the destination alpha is at any point. So I've left the alpha blend fields just with their current values. You may want to change these in the future though, depending on what you're doing exactly. Okay, now moving on, let's enable alpha blending for just the point light system. Head over to its implementation file and in its create pipeline function, after we've set the pipeline config to default, we can then enable blending using the helper function we just created. The last thing to do before running our code is to make use of the alpha component in our point light fragment shader in a non-trivial way. Currently, we always output the value of one, but let's make it so that the alpha component approaches zero as the distance from the center of the point light approaches one. The cosine function can be a nice function for this since it's continuous with zero slope at its max and minimum. We'll need the pi constant to properly map the domain, so I'll define a const float pi variable as 3.14159265384, which is more than enough significant digits. Next, I'll set the alpha value to use 0.5 times cos of my distance times pi plus one in brackets with the cosine function. This will have the effect of transforming the cosine function to this. If we build and run, everything is looking pretty good, but there's actually a small problem, which to demonstrate, I'll need to first disable the rotation of my lights. If we build and run again, if I move the camera so that the red light overlaps the white light, this looks just fine. But if we flip our orientation, we can see a clear problem occurs when the white light overlaps the red light. This is because as I mentioned at the start of the video, ordering matters. In this case, the white light is being rendered first, but when the red light is rendered, the depth buffer signals to the red fragments that they are behind these semi-transparent fragments of the white light. 
so they get discarded. I know what you may be thinking that if we just change how the blending operations are being performed, we should be able to make these things work, right? But no, changing the blend operations just result in other problems, and the only real solutions are to sort all semi-transparent objects and render from back to front, or to use a order-independent rendering technique, which isn't something we can do just yet. So we're going to do the former. We'll make sure that the draw call for each light is ordered by the light's distance from the camera. To start, let's add a helper function to the camera header to get its current position. This can be easily accomplished now that we are also storing the inverse view matrix. The first three values of the last column of the inverse view matrix correspond to the camera's position in world space. So we create a getter function and can cast the last column to a vec3 in order to remove the fourth component. Next in the point light system at the top of the file, I'll import the map header. We're going to use a map as a quick and simple way to sort our point light objects. So below in the render function as an initial step, we'll sort the lights. Create a map object with a float as the maps key and a game object ID as the value. The float key here will be the distance of the point light. We iterate through each point light using the same method as below, going through every game object and filtering out any game object that does not have the point light component. To calculate the distance, we first get the camera's position and subtract the position of the point light. Then by using the dot product with itself, we get the length of the offset vector. Well, technically we're getting the length squared, but that's good enough for our purposes since we only really care about the ordering and computing the square root would only add unnecessary calculations. We then add the game object's ID to our sorted map. Now below, instead of iterating through every game object, we can iterate through the sorted map in reverse order since we want to render the game objects from back to front. So to do this, we'll use a C++ iterator, going from our begin to our end. We fetch the actual game objects by using the object ID from the sorted map to index into the unordered map of all game objects. Game objects are not copyable. That's why we must do it this way, using the game object IDs, rather than copying the actual game object to the sorted map in the previous step. And finally, we can remove this filtering step, as we know already that we only have point lights at this point now. And that's it. We can build and run, and now regardless of the camera's orientation, the lights will be rendered in the correct order. So we will no longer see that artifact when the white light overlaps the red. This wraps up the point light series of videos, and we'll be moving on to textures next, as I know that's a topic many of you have been waiting for. Feel free to experiment with how exactly you render the point light objects. One thing we haven't touched is adding some color variation. If we pull out our cosine function, we can also make use of it when determining each fragment's color. One effect I particularly like is simply adding the cosine term to the light's RGB color which will make the center of each light white and gradually transition to the actual light's color only near the edges. Share any equations you come up with in the comments below or on our Discord. I'd love to see what you guys can come up with. Maybe I could do something like a showcase in a future video. Anyway, thank you for watching and keep on coding. Cheers.